Twilio is one of these companies that during the pandemic had a major hype. Executed to perfection will turn every website into a porn site. So it was one of the pandemic stocks that rose up and up and up. And then as the pandemic kind of came to an end, it started crashing down. So whenever I see a stock that has completely crashed and is not recovering, I'm always wondering, huh, that's a... Uh... That's interesting. What's going on? Because there are some very big companies that had a lot of hype, which usually has some basis, but suddenly they're in a really bad spot. So I want to figure out what is their strategy to get out of this. This is always the most interesting thing. Everybody can have problems, but once you have problems, what do you do to get out of this? Twilio is an American cloud communications company. So what they have found as their niche is all related to customer engagement and communication. As a developer, I said, I'd love it if I could make this phone ring so I could call my customer and do something. And every time I said, but I have no friggin' idea how to make a phone ring, like that's magic. And so we started Twilio in 2008 to give developers the ability to build apps that communicate. So for example, they have a platform that makes it easier to make and receive phone calls, text messages, video messages, and all of that. And of course, it is very valuable because companies always have to engage their customers. This can be new customers if they want to onboard a customer. There's going to be text messages, video, emails, and so on, but also existing customers. If you want to continuously engage them, maybe you want to upsell them. So there's a huge industry utility. And they've done very well. So the company was founded in 2008 and they now have 6,000 employees so they're a pretty big company and they also have over 300,000 active customer accounts so on paper they're doing very well in total they've raised over 600 million dollars over 13 funding rounds which sounds like a lot but if you look at the time since 2008 obviously there's some companies that raise more like Quibi but yeah so they're IPO'd so they went public they're now a publicly traded company since 2016. <laughs> Twilio has two major business units that it's operating. Number one is Twilio Communications. This is their main business. This is the company they founded as. This is customer engagement, allowing a very easy way for companies to, again, make phone calls, send messages, emails, and all of that. So it's a one hub for customer engagement. And of course, there's logic behind it as well. So you can create a lot of automation, which is the benefit. There's a phone call, and then the customer reacts, and then you do this. So obviously, with this type of logic, there's a lot of stuff you can do. You can actually program your own tools or if you're not a programmer you can just use drag and drop. So it's very general or it has a very general usability for companies. And then the second business, this is something that Twilio acquired. Twilio acquired a company called Segment and what Segment does is it allows you to segment customer data. So for example, let's say you have one big group of customers. You have 100,000 customers in there but maybe you want to segment them. Maybe you want to segment them by age. So it's all about compartmentalizing these different customer groups. So basically the second business, Twilio segment, is all about data analysis and structuring your data. So it's a little more passive. So this is where you can connect all your data and then you can make it more usable. You can make it more customized because maybe a marketing campaign is better with that niche, but you don't want to send it to all your customers. So of course there are a lot of different utilities. And if you look at their financials, you can see that the communications part, obviously this is their main business. This is what has had them grow so much. The other company, they bought it. This was an acquisition. It's pretty small. It's not performing as they wanted to perform. Our Twilio segment business, formerly Twilio Data and Applications, while still strategically important to Twilio, continues to underperform. Growth is not yet accelerating up to our expectations. But you get the idea. So all in all, of course, if you look at the website, they have all of these different products and you can see there's something for everything. It's something for programmers, for individual people, for companies. So there's a lot of different tool that they can use. This is not an advertisement for Twilio. I'm not using Twilio, not affiliated with Twilio. But I think if we talk about their strategy, what exactly they do to get out of that mess, you have to understand roughly where they come from and the products that they're selling. So one of the big utilities for companies is, of course, cutting costs, because these are not things that companies are not already doing. Companies are already engaging their customers. They already collect data on them. They already work with that data. But clearly, the use case for using something like Twilio is to cut the costs. And if you look at their website, they, for example, have case studies where a company, whatever, some company has reduced their customer acquisition costs. So instead of having to pay whatever, 50 bucks to get a 
a customer. Now they have to pay 20 bucks to get a customer. This is a huge benefit if you scale. Companies at scale, they love tools like this because they can just reduce the cost without really changing anything else. <laughs> They really found their niche in the communication part. And you have to think about, they come from 2008. This is when the company was founded. So in 2008, things look different. Now, if you hear that, okay, they do customer engagement, maybe you think, okay, there's so many companies doing this. Now there are so many companies doing this. But they were one of the first that really tried to focus on the communication part. And of course, they really established that niche. Because one of the things that companies are doing, especially as it gets more competitive, and especially as you're looking at recurring revenues and you're looking at churn meaning that you have a customer but they drop off they use you for a year or maybe a few months then they drop off but you want to keep them so what companies are trying to do is to always add more products so for example if you look at how salesforce looked like in the beginning look very different from now if you look like zoom in the beginning very different from now microsoft very different from now they add more stuff because they want to earn your subscription amazon prime one of the most popular subscription on the planet keeps adding things games movies tv show free shipping they keep adding things just to earn your subscription so this is what they do the problem with that is that all these companies merge into one goo so they're all kind of the same you're like what is the difference between hubspot and salesforce and twilio and then someone comes well these companies are customer relationship managers and twilio is more for communication but they have a pretty big overlap and the same now that zoom for example is trying to do and i did a video on that they are also trying to get into the goo because they say hey we're video call technology but now we want to have document editing and all the apps and all the integrations and we're kind of trying to become microsoft teams and also we're trying to kind of become hubspot so of course they all go into the goo but if they can have a really good niche where there's maybe let's say there's a customer segment that really only needs a communication part or they're actually relying on the communication part more than these let's say these other tools or they still appreciate however Twilio is handling the UI and allows programmers to interact with the API to create their own tools whatever if you look at it in detail how all these companies interact of course it's a big mess but Twilio still found a very good niche so over time they kept integrating more and more and one of the things they also acquired is for example identity verification which of course is super important I remember 10 years ago there wasn't that much talk on two-factor authentication but now it's mandatory almost everywhere because it just becomes so common that people are locked out of their accounts or they're getting hacked. So two-factor authentication, identity verification. So now they also integrate a lot of security stuff. So you can see that they try to grow. They have a niche, but they recognize that this niche is not enough. They have to grow it. And one of the big ones that they're looking at now is AI. So artificial intelligence, of course, it's a buzzword. Everybody's doing it. And so they're also jumping on the AI part. <laughs> They had major growth. If you look at their financials, they grew from $400 million in revenue per year to over $4 billion in six years. So that's a 10x in revenue. And you can have a 10x in revenue if you maybe have $400,000, let's say, dollars in revenue, and then you go to $4 million, that's a 10x. But the higher you go, the more impressive a 10x is. And if you have a 10x from $400 million to $4 billion, that's extremely impressive. Their share price skyrocketed. They went from 40 per share to over $400 per share in 2021. But if you remember, 2021 was the peak. If you look at all these pandemic stocks, they all peaked in 2021. This was exactly what it started to go down. And why? Because of the low interest rate during COVID. Because stimulating the economy, quote unquote, works really well if you put the interest rate to zero. And if the interest rate is put to zero, it means that cash is cheap. So if you have to take on debt, it's much cheaper to take on debt with an interest rate of zero than if the interest rate is high. So as soon as you have a zero interest rate policy or ZERP, a lot of companies that are burning money that are not profitable are suddenly looking really good because they rely on cheap capital. If they can raise a lot of money, it doesn't matter if they're not profitable. So you saw a lot of companies during 2021 grow really, really big, have really high valuations, very 
high market cap if you look at the publicly traded companies. But if you look at their financial, you see that they are not profitable at all. They're burning money. They're burning a lot of money. And the same was true for Twilio. They kept burning money, but they looked really good because the interest rate was zero. And then you saw all these companies that look so sexy as the interest rate was zero suddenly look really, really bad. And then all the investors lost confidence because they thought, yes, the company grows fast. But if the company cannot raise any more money, they're going to die because they're not profitable. If you have a profitable company, even if they can't raise money, they can make it work because they're profitable. But if they're unprofitable, if they don't raise money, that's it. They literally have to file for bankruptcy. And if you look closely at the financials of Twilio, they are burning a billion US dollars a year. One billion US dollars in negative income. This is such a standard thing. It's almost like Pac-Man because as soon as a company has a lot of money and grows really big, they just keep acquiring other companies. It's almost like they have to spend the money, which of course investors want you to spend money. They don't want you to sit on a lot of cash. If you have way too much cash that just you don't need, they want you to spend it. Spend it on acquisitions, spend it on investments, whatever. Hire more people is a very common one. So the two things you always see with these companies is they hire a lot, they hire more than they need to, because they and the investors think spending money helps. Spending money helps things going faster, which obviously is true to some degree, but most companies do a little too much. So they kept hiring and they kept acquiring. So they acquired about 12 different companies, most notably SendGrid, 3 billion US dollars, which is a customer communication platform. Sounds like a good fit. And then Segment, which I already talked about, for 3.2 billion US dollars. And they hired so much. They had at their peak almost 9,000 employees. 9,000 employees. And that was in September 2022. And now look at the growth. About 9,000 in September 2022, but 7,300 in September 20. 21. So in one year, they basically hired 1,600 employees. This was the zero interest rate policy. This was the ZERP period. This is exuberance. That's quite a lot of hiring in a very short amount of time. So under 500 employees in 2014, 7,000 in 2021, 9,000 in 2022. That was quite expensive and this did not help profitability. If you're a company that's not profitable and everything is going up and you're growing fast and everybody loves you and now you hire 1,000 500 more people. Even if these were 1,500 profitability cost cutting experts, you have to pay 1,500 more people. This did not help. And they're backpedaling now big time. They keep laying off. I'm going to show you the numbers in a bit. Now we get to the good part. I probably shouldn't say that. The good part is a strategy. But now we get to the crash. So they had about a peak of 400 per share. So $400 per share. And they crashed to 50. So this is an 88% drop. This is classic pandemic stock behavior. Unprofitable. During the ZERP period, everything is going well. And if you remember, Kathy Wood, the ARK Innovation Fund, had the same problem because these disruptive innovations that a lot of investors really like these deep tech, very technical, very expensive innovations, they're usually unprofitable. A lot of companies are unprofitable, especially in the growth phase. But this is really bad if the interest rate is really high because now capital is just very expensive. So Kathy Wood had the same fate as the pandemic stocks because she invested in quite a few pandemic stocks. So let's go back to the financials. So I showed you the financials, the revenues, so revenue, profit, costs, and so on, and the income. And it looked really good because they had insane growth. We had a 10x growth to 4 billion in revenue per year, which is amazing. But what started happening is suddenly the growth slowed down. And we have seen that before. Let's look at a company like Facebook. At some point, everybody's on Facebook. They can't find any more users. This is a problem. So they have to find different ways to grow. And you don't want to be a cancer. You don't want to grow forever because at some point you're just saturated. You just have everyone who wants to use your platform. This might have happened to them. This is the first big insight that is that they might might have reached saturation, which would be pretty bad because they are unprofitable. They have a lot of problems. Growth is usually presented as a solution to everything. If you say that, yeah, we are currently unprofitable and there are still 
some issues and so on, but growth is going to solve everything. So we are going to try to grow as much as possible. But if you're suddenly saturated, you hit a wall and now you have to face all these problems. Wait, you're not profitable because you can't grow anymore. You're not going to suddenly have really high margin revenues and then all your profitability problems are going to be solved magically. You have to solve it now. So have they reached saturation? I don't know, but for sure they've hit a wall because they're currently barely growing 5% each quarter. So this is pretty bad. And they burn so much money. They're burning a billion a year. And when I'm saying burning, I'm talking about negative income. This is literally after all the revenues are already deducted. Impressive revenues, four billion a year, but they're burning a billion a year. Each quarter, they're losing hundreds of millions. And to make it worse, they made these huge acquisitions, for example, Segment for three billion, and it doesn't perform well, which is bad because if a company is buying another company, let's say for three billion, and their revenues are in that same magnitude. So let's say the revenue at the time were also three billion or four billion. They expect a return on investment. They just don't want to buy a company to lose a competitor. They try to buy the company in order to help their growth. So this segment business seemed extremely synergistic. It seems like an obvious choice. Of course you want to have that business because you do customer communication. They do customer data optimization. This is the perfect match. Your customers are going to love it. You can get their customers on your platform and your customers from your platform can go on to theirs. Perfect synergy. This is what you would think, but it didn't work. Either because it's too complicated or maybe there's just very little value when it actually comes to the customer engagement or maybe the integration is bad, but the growth isn't really there. So now they have to deal with all that stuff. They hit a wall, they're maybe saturated, no more growth. Their latest big acquisition didn't really work out that well. So now they get the pressure because public companies, they have a lot of pressure. They have so many investors, they have large institutional investors, they have boards, they have to deal with a lot of pressure. So this is what happened with them. So they had to do a lot of layoffs just to cut costs because in a high interest rate environment, you can't be unprofitable on that level. And also the investors can kept pressuring them so much that the CEO had to step down. This is how much power investors can have. And there's very few CEOs. And of course, it also depends on the governance structure. So not everything is always possible. And also the personal support, I guess, of the people involved in the management and so on. But there's very few people, for example, Mark Zuckerberg, who can say, we are investing billions in the metaverse and there's nothing you can do about it. We're just going to do it no matter what you say. There's very few people who can put their foot down. Big round of applause to Mark Zuckerberg for being able to pull through and now his stock went way up everybody loves him again but it's very rare that a CEO has that kind of power so of course if you're founder CEO it can work but it didn't work for the Twilio CEO because the CEO and founder was kicked out of the company basically he had to step down they were pressured by the investors they just didn't like what he was doing or maybe they didn't like him whatever the reason is and now spend the last 12 to 18 months turning it into a profitable growth and you're absolutely right AI is being uh, is the potential to be a great tailwind for us. They're also pressuring them to sell this segment business again. This company they bought for 3.2 billion US dollars. Now the investors say, hey, it doesn't work. It doesn't integrate. It's not really growing. Sell it again. You can't use this. It doesn't work. It doesn't increase shareholder value. Sell the company. So far, Twilio has put their foot down, has said, no, we keep segment. We're going to make it work no matter what. But if the investors have so much power that they actually manage to sack the CEO, then I don't think there's anything they can't do because that's basically like killing the king if you take out the CEO of the company. And now, of course, everybody's looking at the CEO because changing the CEO of a company is super critical. If you think, oh, this is an interesting company, I might want to invest, publicly traded, you can buy their stock. Hmm, what's going on here? Wait, they just changed the CEO? Let's wait because we don't know how the new CEO is going to handle it. Does the new CEO have experience being a CEO? Does he have experience in that particular field? And also, who has selected that CEO? Because the old CEO was kicked out. So the old CEO probably didn't appoint the new CEO. That's not how it works. So why him? Who made the decision? So there are a lot of unanswered questions. So it's kind of critical to first observe, especially with the CEO change. Now we get to the best part. This is a strategy. This is what they're trying to do to get out of this. So now you understand what is the company doing, all that stuff. They had the CEO change and all of that. So what is their strategy? So their strategy is actually very simple. Number one, artificial intelligence. They want to use artificial intelligence to create new customer value and to make the company more efficient. We remain extremely bullish on AI. 
and our ability to innovate across our portfolio with several incredible examples in both our product roadmaps and in private beta. We have a number of uh, AI-related products that we've been able to put into our roadmap, examples being voice intelligence, Broad Guard, Flex, we've got a lot of other products and features. Inside the company, there's a lot of automation of internal processes that uh, I think are a big opportunity that will help us become more efficient. Which sounds great. It can work. Meta, Facebook has really made AI work. And there's other companies, I believe Klauna, there's other companies that have really made it work with AI and have really been able to cut costs. So this is a decent strategy. Number two, making the segment business work. Again, this company they bought doesn't work. On hand, segment is strategically important to the company. But on the other hand, we are approaching the review that we talked about with an open mind. Um, we know the business is underperforming. We definitely do believe that we can execute better. And we're just approaching the operational review with an open mind so that we can determine the best path forward. So they want to make that work. This is probably not the hill they want to die on, but it's really important to them because they're committed. They bought the company. They want to make it work. And they also want to use AI for that. And number two, this is what they're doing this whole time now. This is almost their main focus. They want to cut costs. So they are in a situation where they need two things. And these things are probably things that every single company in the world wants to do. And this is to cut costs and to make more money. This is probably what every single human is trying to do in the world. But this is what they want to do, cut costs. The first two parts about the AI and making segment work, this is all about making more money. But the third part is cutting costs. Of course, AI can also play a part in that. But the big one is layoffs. They hired way too many people. And also, since AI is a thing, you notice that you can actually fire a lot of people and you can still operate because you can automate a lot of things. <music> All right, so for the investability of the company, what are the good parts? The good parts is they have a lot of cash. They have a lot of cash in the bank. They have about four billion in cash and cash equivalents, which is a lot, which is great. They have limited debt, so they have more money than they actually have debt, which is a very good thing if your company is burning a billion a year. If your company is burning a billion a year, you better have four billion in your bank account because now they can last for four years. I'm super simplifying because they also have debt, but let's say you can last for a while. This is good. This company Companies like 23andMe, they burn a lot of money, but they don't have a lot of cash in the bank. They might go bankrupt if nothing happens. So it's good. So they have a lot of cash. Number two, which is a good thing, they hired so many people, probably way more than they need. If you hire 1,500 in a year, it's crazy. They hired way too many people, probably way more than they need. That means they can cut a lot. They have a lot of meat where they can cut something out when things get tough. And they already started doing that. So they had about 6,000 employees in 2023. And remember, they had 9,000 employees in 2022. So they cut 3,000 employees. In one year, they hired 1,500. In the next year, they cut 3,000. If they keep cutting, they're almost halving their entire team. If they cut another 1,500 or 1,400, they're going to half their entire team from the peak, which of course is something that a lot of companies did. A lot of companies started firing. There's companies that really don't want to fire people because they just feel bad for them. I mean, if you have a job and suddenly you're being laid off. This sucks, obviously. But there's companies who don't care. I mean, I don't want to say they don't care, but they fire 3,000 people and they're still doing layoffs. So I think they're one of the companies where if you get fired, they wish you the best, but no hard feelings. Yeah, I don't think the size of the workforce is the main driver of our growth ambitions. Our employees have undergone a lot of change this past year. Yet through it all, They've remained committed to building a great company that's focused on delivering for our customers. Number two, which is kind of good, could also be bad, but the business is mostly in the US. So US to international is about two to one. So most of their revenues comes from US market. This could be good because it means that there's other markets that can still penetrate. This could also be bad because it could mean that other markets don't really have the interest. So your company or your products and services don't really have the appeal in the other markets. And then this could be good to neutral. The new CEO seems somewhat experienced, so definitely held the position as CFO at the company, but also COO and has had different positions that seem like he has a very broad experience. It's very hard to predict how someone's going to perform, but it doesn't seem to be the worst pick. And he also made some interesting moves because he appointed someone as president of the segment business, someone who has experience when it comes to AI businesses. So this might be a very interesting shift. And then also part of the acquisitions is that they're going 
going in the authentication, security, and identity business. So they're really trying to expand the security part, which is an interesting niche because in a world where HubSpot and Salesforce take these huge places when it comes to customer relationship management, it's good to see that they're not trying to eat their lunch because you don't want to compete with these big companies. You're trying to expand in a different niche and maybe add a different niche to your main product, but it has to be one that has synergy, something that your customers really like, and security, authentication, and so on. If this is something you've identified as a good niche, then this would be a good thing. So this is what they're already doing. And then something that surprised me is that, weirdly, they have a lot of exposure to crypto markets. Similar to the last two quarters, our Q4 revenue growth rate was negatively impacted by headwinds from customers in the crypto industry. So when we had the big crypto crash, the Sam bankman fried crypto crash, and 3 Arrow Capital and Celsius and so on, I mean, crypto had a rough year. When all of this happened, then Twilio actually saw a strong impact because I guess a lot of their customers are these marketers that use messaging and email and phone calls and so on, they use Twilio. So that's a very interesting thing that they had a very strong exposure. But on the flip side, which is why it's a good thing, when crypto goes up again, it could actually have the opposite effect. So it can actually carry their revenues a little further because all of these companies are going to come back as soon as the next crypto bull run is coming. It's a bit of a long shot, but it was interesting because they literally said it the earnings call. Now the bad things. So why this whole thing might actually not be that optimistic. Number one is they have to cut a lot to be profitable. I said, yeah, they have so many employees, but if you want to cut 1 billion in costs per year, it's very hard to fire a lot of people and keeping the wheels on. Honestly, kudos to Elon Musk because he fired an insane amount of people. He ate so much shit for that because people just really hated on him. They're still hating on him, but he kept it going. So some people complained that, oh, there was a period where the user experience was a little worse because maybe some things didn't work as well. But considering how many people he fired and he kept it all alive and he kept it all functioning. So firing a lot of people and keeping the wheels turning, this is a difficult thing. So if they want to cut 1 billion, I don't think it's going to work. They have to increase revenue. Just cutting costs to 1 billion, if they are the AI wizards and they can do what other companies did where they really improve their costs when it comes to replacing certain work tasks, just by automating with AI and they can save a lot of costs. Yes, but cutting 1 billion, I think that's going to be really tough for them. And the bet on AI is a little bit of a last resort because they're not an AI company. And every company under the sun have thought, oh, we're going to use AI now. Maybe they put AI in their name. And even they, they put AI, I believe, somewhere in the LinkedIn bio. Hey, this is really important to us. But it sounds to me a little bit like they're trying to invoke the secret magic word AI and they hope that people are going to believe them? Have they seen proof that this is actually working? So have they any numbers that show, hey, AI can save us 1 billion a year? I don't believe it until I see it because AI is such a buzzword. If you don't have proof, you don't really have anything. And with the international expansion, I don't think this is going to be that great because US companies pay the most. They're probably the most interconnected and they're using a lot of different tools. But where do you want to go? Maybe in Asian markets, this will be very interesting, but I don't know how it is with the language barrier. I don't know how they're going to handle that. And then South America, I would imagine the market is tiny. And Europe, hard to say. I guess Europe would be an interesting market, but European companies don't have as much money. And also, there might be a little less modern and digitized compared to US companies. And then the other one, when it comes to expanding the product value, especially they have to grow their revenue. So they look into the segment business, data analysis, and so on. And then they look into security, identity, and so on. I don't know how big that market is. So I don't know how big security is going to expand and their product. And I don't think they're going to eat the lunch of HubSpot and Salesforce anytime soon. And I don't think it would be valuable if they put on a dress and start dancing and try to do all these different types of products. Hey, now we'd also do video calls, you know, stuff like that. I think it would be silly for them to try to expand in areas where other companies are already dominating. So I think it's going to be very tough for them to really improve their value. I see AI, honestly, as the biggest opportunity, but I don't know if they can do it because AI can just reduce costs, increase efficiency, and then they need less 
SaaS staff, they can improve maybe the integration between segment and the main business. They can make everything easier, but are they able to do that? I don't know. And then of course, the worst part is that they kicked out the CEO or he had to resign. This was an overnight thing. This is the worst thing. This is one of the biggest warning signs. This is like, oh no, our kingdom is very stable, but the king died yesterday, but everything is good, you know? So if this happens, it's such a dramatic shift. So I would actually be very careful about making any predictions about this company now. So here's my completely amateur and probably inaccurate prediction, but this is what I think is the most likely, what they are probably going to do. They're probably going to have a long and painful period, probably a year or whatever, where they just try to keep cutting costs. I think the growth is going to be slow. Maybe there's going to be some AI magic and maybe there's going to be growth, but it's probably going to be very slow growth and they keep firing people and they keep trying to cut costs. I don't think they're going to be profitable in a year, but they will keep painfully trying to cut costs. There's also some pressures that tell the company that it should be acquired by another company, but there isn't really another company that had enough money and interest to buy them, I think. So I don't think they're going to be acquired anytime soon. Might be wrong, but I don't think it's going to happen. I also don't think that they're suddenly going to grow. I think they're going to be in limbo for a while trying to cut costs. And based on other companies that had major success, I would say that AI is their biggest investment opportunity and the biggest thing that they should look at in order to help themselves. Because a company like that, if it can automate a lot, then it's going to be very profitable. Because in the end, what they're doing is not quote unquote rocket science. What they're doing is customer communication. And by nature, they're already automating a lot of things for the customers. Now they have to learn how to automate things for themselves. And you take a note in your head, you say, okay, well, I guess that wasn't interesting to them. <laughs> 